Hope you had a great functional comp up until now. Um, I'm Marcus Haug, I'm comp-centric, and today I will talk about free all the things. So maybe show of hand who knows about the free monad. Okay, the free applicative. Less hands. Who knows about the free monoid? Okay, perfect, because you're here to learn what it is. And basically we will talk about free whatever you want, whatever type class you want to free. So I will show you a technique how to do that. So the goal is, as I said, to explain this technique. We will apply this technique on different examples so you get a feel how to do it yourself. And I hope that you can have a as a takeaway that you yourself can do this at home, find a type class and free it. Okay, so let's go. Here's the definition, and it says a free functor is left adjoint to a forgetful functor, right? That's easy, what's the problem? It's like the monad meme. Okay, here's another definition I, call, I, uh, I came across when I searched for free. And it says a free thing, let's call it free A, on a type class that we call A, is the A itself, so a monoid is a monoid, a monoid is a monad. And a function, let's call it inject, returns, uh, it takes an X of type A and returns a free A. And it has to obey some rules such that for anything, let's call it B, and a function F from A to B, there exists a unique homomorphism G such that G composed with inject is the same as F. So basically what this says is that the G function and the inject function have to be the inverse. So inject brings you into the structure and G brings you out again. Okay, this is still very complicated. Um, so here's a more, much more simple definition that uh, I think um, uh, hits the point pretty well. A free X is the minimal structure that satisfies the laws of the type class X. And if you don't get this yet, don't worry because there's an easy mechanical recipe to how to free a type class. And it's basically four easy steps that we will repeat in the following slides. First, we define an AST for the type class operations. We add an inject operator, we will see that in a moment. We write an interpreter for it and then we check the laws. Okay, but before we begin, why should I care about free at all, right? Okay, so first of all, you get a nice API that is based on the type class. That means if you have a free monad, every user that knows how to use a monad can use your DSL. If you have a free monoid, everybody who knows how to use a monoid can use your DSL, and so on. Um, you can basically then use your free X as if it was a monad, that's what I said, and you can lift your DSL operations using this inject clause we will see. And you get back your program as a data structure. And this is really cool because you can optimize the program, you can analyze it, and you can interpret it in different ways. So your, your user may not have thought about executing a program in parallel, and he just doesn't care, but you can do that. Okay, some disclaimer. Um, what I'm going to do is also called the deep embeddings approach, or the initial encoding, or the data structure representation, and it's different from the final techless approach. Um, finally, techless would also have been possible for this talk, but especially later when we go into program optimization, this is much more cumbersome. Um, for some type classes, there are also different sets of minimal operations. Like for Monad, there are at least three different sets of like, you can have flat map and um, return, and you can have return, join, and bind. And this technique actually works for every minimal subset. And if you want, you can try this at home with a different subset. I've just chosen one arbitrarily, more or less, because I can show something cool with it. And this talk might include some hand-waving, it's, but it's for your own good, and hopefully you won't notice. Okay, so let's go into freeing the monad first. So here we have the monad type class that has the pure function instead of return, and the flat map function that given an uh, FA that is wrapped in this higher kind of type constructor, and a function that is, uh, gets the A returns an uh, F of B. You probably know this type class by now, hopefully. And as you might know, if you have been in George's talk, there also have to be some laws for the type class. And for the monad, we have three laws. We have left identity, which says that when you lift something into the monad with pure and you flat map over it, this should be the same as just applying the F purely. And if you um, have an FA and you flat map over it with pure, this should uh, have no effect at all. And there's also the associativity law, which looks a, bit, a little bit strange with flat maps, but you just have to believe me on that, there's just associativity. Okay, so we know the type class, we know the laws, let's go to the recipe. 
So the first step, as I said, is to define an AST of the operations. So we go on and we create a sealed abstract class that we call free. And we have one class pure that captures the pure operation. And we have one node in our AST that is called flat map. And it just captures the argument that our normal flat map function would take. So we have an FA of type free of FA and a function that goes from A to a free of FB. And then we add one more case that I called inject. You can also call it pure or whatever you want. Okay, not pure because I'm already using pure, but there are different names for it. And then you can have a monad instance for our data structure. And whenever we call pure on our monad, we just capture that in the pure node. And whenever we call flat map, we just capture it in the flat map node. So in essence, we are just building up an AST when we are using the monad of the free function, of the free monad. Okay, and then we need something as a next step to go back from our free monad into the land of the normal monads. So for that, we write a function that is called run free, and it takes a natural transformation that translates this higher kind of F into some target monad that is here called M. So here you can see that M has a context bound uh, for monad. And then it takes the free uh, monad also as an argument. And what we do is we just pattern match on the instructions and if it's a pure node, we translate it into the target monads pure. If it's a flat map, we translate it into the target monads flat map and run free recursively down the two nodes. And if it's an inject, we actually call our natural transformation. And this is the part where you um, reduce your DSL into the target monad as well. Okay, so we have our structure, we have our free monad, and now we need to care about the laws. And as you might remember, there is this associativity law for free monads. I just had it, I have it on the slide here again. And when you look at our structure, if you translate this to the AST, you can have two expressions, one and two. The one is the flat map of the first equation, of the left-hand side of the equation, and the second one is the right-hand side equation. So obviously this is not equal, right? So we are violating the laws. That means it's not the free monad. Okay, so as a programmer, you can argue that, okay, it's not really the free monad, but after interpretation, if your target monad is lawful, nobody will notice. And the mathematician or the category theorist will tell you, no, this is not the free monad. So there's also a kind of a trade-off between enforcing these laws via construction or just um, taking this uh, as, a, as a problem but ignoring it and um, getting rid of it during interpretation. But let's see what we can do here in our case. So we have this flat map operation for our free monad, monad instance. And instead of doing the normal flat map, we can actually do some optimization. So we have the left identity law, which tells us that whenever we flat map over a pure node, we can just purely apply the app. So let's just do that in our flat map implementation here. And we can do the same thing for the flat map, where it says that if you have the, uh, so that we are already in a flat map and we are flat mapping again. And then the associativity law tells us that we can transform this into this uh, equivalent version. And we can just reason this by the laws. If you have been in George's talk, you might um, recognize this. So here's actually the, the equation again. So we just applied the left-hand side, which has uh, two inner flat maps, and we just transformed it to the right-hand side with a nested flat map. Okay, so maybe a small quiz. What about the other identity law? Can't we just optimize when we flat map with pure? Does anybody have an idea? Can we do this? Or is that a problem? Yes, it's a problem. So actually the problem is that we would have to pattern match on the left-hand side and we would have to determine that the function is a pure. But we cannot compare functions for equality. We cannot check that it's a pure function. So we can actually, we have to ignore that uh, the law, we cannot enforce this in our structure. Okay, so as you, have, as you can see, laws are not boring. They allow us to do refactorings without changing the program meaning and they also allow optimizations. Because for example, in this case, by doing the uh, associativity to the right, we can have a stack safe free monad. Because if you look into the structure, instead of building up nested flat map nodes that we have to have traversed down and up again, we can now have an outer flat map node. We recurse into FA and we have a function and then we apply this function and we get back a new node. 
So effectively, what we have reinvented here is trample lining for our free monad and will be stack safe. And we didn't even think about this. Okay, so for, with this, we are basically done with the free monad. So we, we have a DSL with monad expressiveness. We can uh, use this to embed our own DSLs. We have uh, context sensitivity. We can do branching in our DSL loops, fancy control flow, but this is not a free monad talk. So if you want to learn more about this, you go have to go to a free monad talk. Instead, what we will do is we will go um, and free the functor. And again, we will do the same four steps. So we define our AST, add the inject clause, write our interpreter, and we have to check the laws. Okay, so here's our functor type class. It's easier than the monad. We just have one function that is called map, and given an f of a and a function from a to b, it returns an f of b. What are the laws? Well, we have the identity law, which says that when we are mapping with identity over it, this should have no effect. And we have the composition law that says when we map twice, this should be the same as mapping once using the composition of the functions. Okay, so again, we, um, we create an AST. We call it free functor. It has two cases. One is the fmap case from our type class, and there's one additional case for our inject. Okay, that's basically it. That's a free functor, right? That was easy. The next step is to minimize the structure again. And we have to ask ourselves, can we get rid of anything? So if you look at our structure again, and you look um, at the inject case, you could actually replace this with fmap, because the inject case just has an fa of type fa, and the fmap also has an fa here of type fx, but it can be just renamed. And then we just have to fill in this f with something. And we can write a smart constructor that uh, fills this f with identity, so we can just get rid of the inject case completely. And we have a more minimal structure. Okay, so does anybody see a problem with this code snippet? And as a hint, if you're an OO programmer, you should immediately see this. If you think from our own perspective, any ideas? So we have a superclass, but we have just one subclass. What's the case of a superclass if you only have one subclass? And we should check if we could get rid of this one superclass. Okay, so, and for this we have to ask ourselves what role does the super trait or the superclass currently play? And currently it serves just the purpose that the free functor has two type parameters and the fmap has three. And so to get rid of this mismatch, we can use a type member, put the x into an existential type member, and just get rid of the uh, superclass completely. So this is even better because we only have one node, the fmap node. And the inject just gets a little bit more complicated because we have to instantiate the, uh, the type member. And if you look closely at this, it might get familiar, depending on how deep you are into category theory. And if you rename it, it's just Koyoneda. And it already sounds much cooler than just freeing the functor. And then you can just uh, write the functor instance for our free functor, or we, let's call it Koyoneda. And um, this is basically the, the next mechanical step. And then you run your free functor by mapping over it and just applying the function that was composed inside. Okay, that's basically it. We freed the functors. So what do we get? Well, we get in DSL with functorial expressiveness. What does that mean? Yeah, well, we can only map. But what we get for free is map fusion. So our DSL users can map as often as they want, and they don't have to care about intermediate structures or whether they have, can do a map, uh, map fusion optimization on their own. We take care of that for them. And what's even more interesting is that functors can often be composed with other structures, giving them map fusion as an addition. So for example, there once was a free monad that had a uh, composition with a free functor just to get map fusion for free on free monads. Okay, that was a free functor. Let's go on to free the monoid. And again, we look at the type class. So the monoid has two operations. The first is called empty, and the second is called combine. You are probably familiar with that by now. And if we blindly follow our approach, we start with the structure of the free monoid, 
Then we have the empty case, the combined case, and our added inject case. Should be quite familiar by now. And we have three laws. It's left identity, so empty combined with x, so the pipe plus pipe is just an infix combined should be only the x and the same for the right hand side. So this essentially just says as empty is as boring as you want it to be. And we have the associativity law, which says that it doesn't matter in uh, which order we evaluate this expression, whether we first evaluate two plus three and then plus one, or whether we evaluate one plus two and then plus three, the order doesn't matter. Okay, so now let's try to enforce those laws on our structure. And even though monoid is actually simpler than the functor and the uh, monad, it will be a little bit more complex to enforce those laws. And we have to make one almost arbitrary decision. You will see in a moment why uh, I made this choice. We will associate to the right. We could also have associate to the left, but we will get a little something out that is a little different. Okay, so to fix associativity, we have to um, and decide, as I said, for left or right, and then we have to forbid the other one. So what is okay in our case would be to have a combine where the left-hand side is an inject, and then on the right-hand side there can be more combines, but we cannot allow that on the left-hand side there is an inner combine, because this would be left associativity. Okay, so we can uh, solve this by having another trait that just says this is a not, not a combine, so this is basically just a marker, and then in the combined case, we say the left-hand side has to be a not combined. So this can either be an inject or an empty, but it cannot be a combined because combined does not extend not combined. Makes sense. Okay, so this would get rid of the associativity for combining, but we could do, still do combine of empty and empty. So we have not only one empty, we could have two empties. And to minimize our structure, we can ask ourselves, can we get rid of this duplicate empties, or can we get rid of empty at all? And um, it's not possible to get rid completely, as we'll see in a moment, but we can limit ourselves to have only one empty in our structure. And for this, we have to restrict our combine to not only forbid on the left-hand side um, the combine function, but we forbid combine or the uh, empty. So empty can be only on the right-hand side and combine as well. And again, the goal is to have the minimal canonical structure for our free monoid. Okay, so if we do this, we have on the left-hand side of combine only the inject case. And then we have our case class inject that doesn't inherit anything. But if you look a little bit closer now, inject is kind of silly because it's just wrapping things up, it's just identity. So we can get rid of, we can basically get rid of it completely. So even better, we have one structure, one constructor less in our AST. Okay, so let's try this structure and write the monoid instance. So for the empty case, we return the empty node. And for the combine, we pattern match. If it's an empty, we return the right-hand side. And if it's a combine, we combine the head with a recursive call on the tail. Okay, this might start to look familiar again. Does anybody see a familiar structure? Maybe look for a moment. Okay, we, maybe it helps if we rename everything a little bit. Do you now recognize it? So it's, we basically just reinvented the normal single link list. And if you associate to the right, you get the normal list. If you associate to the left, you just get the backward single link list. Okay, so for this, with this, we freed monoids. And we get a DSL that we combine stuff with, which is pretty handy most of the time. It works beautifully with folds. For example, MapReduce is just, if you just use monoids and folds, it's beautiful. And we can also, for example, interpret our program in parallel, recursing down the, the nodes of our AST because of associativity. So this gives a lot of freedom to us when we have programs um, that our DSL users have written. Okay, it seems like this approach works pretty well. So now that we can free basically anything, we just need a new nail for our hammer. And um, when I thought about this, I remembered an old blog post by uh, Chris Duccio 
which talked about free objects, and he used free Boolean algebras as an example. So this is a good example, and we have our recipe, so let's just apply our steps to Boolean algebras. And if you're not familiar with them, um, a Boolean algebra has basically a true case, a false case, which you know from normal Booleans, and then the not that negates the and and the or. And from this you can basically build your normal Boolean algebra using other ones that can be derived from this, like x, or, nand, nor, whatever you want. Okay, but let's just apply our um, normal steps again. So our AST looks a little bit more complicated this time. We have the free bool case, and we have a case object for true and false. And we have cases for the not, the and, and the operator, which all just capture their arguments. And again, we have our edit inject case. Okay, so now we just need an interpreter for our Boolean algebras. We will step, we will skip the optimization in this case. And um, if we want to interpret our free Boolean algebra that is given as fb, we need a function that also goes from a free bool of a. So here's the a. We need a function from a to b to get rid of this. And the target is another Boolean algebra. So we say that the type b has to be a Boolean algebra. We have a free bool of a and a function that maps this a to a Boolean algebra as well. So when we tear down the structure, we pattern match on our operations. If it's true, we return the target true. If it's false, we return the target false. If it's inject, we use our actual function. So this is where we have to translate the holes in our DSL that um, some user would have um, written into the target Boolean algebra as well. And for the other cases, we just recurse down and use the target Boolean algebra operations. And there were nice animation, animation for that. Okay, that was simple, although it was a little bit boilerplate by now because it's always the same uh, pattern. Um, we will skip trying to encode the laws, basically because I don't know how to do it, and it's much more involved than monoid because there are a lot of laws uh, for Boolean algebras. But as long as the target we are interpreting in two is lawful, at least morally, this is okay. So what's more interesting is what can we do with our new discovered structure? And as a reminder, our DSL users can do an anything that the normal Boolean can do, like true, false, and, or, XOR implies, NAND, nor, whatever your Boolean uh, operation you want. Okay, so here's the example that I came up with. Let's imagine that we want to write a new website search, basically a new Google, because we need that. And for this DSL that our users can use, we have this search ADT, which has different, key, different uh, keywords for our DSL, and it can search by term. It can search whether something is after a date. It can check whether something occurs in the text or whether it occurs in the, US, in the URL. And after sneaking in some syntactic sugar, our DSL users can basically write predicates or searches like this. So we can say that there has to be the term functional programming. It has to be indexed after 2018 one one. Um, there has to be the, there there should not be the term Java or Spring in the website, and the, the URL should contain functional conf. So what our users are building up basically is the AST that looks like this. So we have the AND of the term node, then we have a nested AND that has the after node, another AND with the NOT and the OR, and then the leaves all are just our DSL operations if you look closely. Okay, now we just need a type that we can run our predicate against. And for our domain, Let's imagine that we have stored website case classes that um, contain handily some terms, URL, uh, the index at date, and the full text of the website. So all our predicates will be run against this site. Okay, we know how to tear down our free bool. I've shown that on a previous site, but we do not yet know how to interpret our search DSL. And for that, we have to create a new function. I call it evil search that takes a free bool of search and a site and returns a boolean and what it does is it uses um, an inner function that I call net that goes from our search to a boolean. And then we can pattern match on the term and check whether our actual site we are checking against concerns the term uh, t here, whether it was indexed after the date we specified, 
whether the full text contains the string we have given it and whether the URL contains the, the word we have um, expected. And then we just uh, call our teardown operation, the run free bool, to get rid of all of the AST, and we will get back true or false. So what we can, for example, do is, if we go through all sites, we can filter them and evil, call evil search on them, and we will get back all sites matching our predicate. Okay, so let's get back to our predicate that we've seen on the previous slide. So if you have a site like this here, and you have our predicate, you would basically iterate over this. You would check that for the term node, uh, whether the term is uh, in FP or Bangalore. So this would already be true. Whether it was indexed after the 1st of 2018, this would also be true. Whether the term Java is in there, this would be false. Whether the text spring is in there, this would also be false. And in the URL should be functional conf, and this should be true. So basically, you will get back um, uh, AST that looks like this after eliminating your, um, your DSL. And then you can tear this down to basically um, true or false at the end. Okay, so this is like the basic usage of free boolean algebra, but there's actually a lot more interesting stuff that you can do with this. For example, you could short circuit or do other optimizations. So for example, here, if we go to, if we would have faults here, we could just forget about all of the right-hand side. We don't have to evaluate all of that. Um, you could also do like eliminate double navigation, um, perform some canonical forms of the boolean um, um, and and ors. You could partially evaluate the predicates, so we will see this in a moment. For example, um, imagine you don't have all of the information required to evaluate your predicate fully. Um, then you can partially evaluate it and maybe just load more information or just send it on to another party. And what you can also have, which we are not show today, is you could have a core language like our search predicate that is barely low level, and then you could have a higher level language that is a little bit richer and, for example, encapsulates the term matcher, which is like just taking a string and you could replace that with is fp website and translate this into your primitive language as term has fp. Okay, but let's talk about the optimization first. So this is pretty easy. Here's like one uh, simple step in the optimization case. You could apply this, apply this as a fixed point and just optimize your whole program. And what we do is we just look at some basic patterns. So for example, if we find a, a double negation, we can just forget about the double negation. If we have an or that has a left-hand side of, or the right-hand side of true, we can just short circuit, and the same for the end case. But there are more things you could also just recognize whether there is an x or and stuff like that. But the more interesting case is partial evaluation. And as I said, just imagine you have, might only have a, a part of the information that is required to reduce the predicate. For our problem, you could imagine that the full, deck, full text of the index website is, that, is stored somewhere else, and you would like to avoid loading the full website if possible. So the idea is to evaluate as much as possible. If we can reduce it to true or false, okay, that's perfect. We don't have to load the text. Otherwise, we might have to fetch it uh, or maybe send it on to another system that can um, retrieve the full text. So for this, let's uh, create another case class that is just called site metadata that has only the terms, the URL, and the index at. So the full text is missing here. And then we can write another uh, function that is called partially. And instead of taking a full website, it just takes the site metadata and our normal search predicate. So from the user's point of view, this is unchanged. And it returns an option of a Boolean. And the option is basically the semantics of um, if it's some, then we f could evaluate this. And if it's none, we just didn't know what to do. We didn't have the required information. So in our case, for the term, after, and in URL case, we can do the evaluation. And for the index, we just have to say none. We don't know how to do that. And after we have this, we can write our partial evaluator. That just is like our normal evaluator, but it uh, takes, instead of an a to B here, it takes an A to option B, which fits the uh, signature we have written on the previous slide. And then it just tries to evaluate everything. Here I'm using an either sneakily for the uh, short circuiting. You can think about this if you want to or talk to me in the hall, but it's a little bit tricky. And then we can just recurse down with this partial evaluator and whenever you can uh, 
evaluate something, you just replace it with a value, and otherwise you have to go on and do more. Okay, so let's go back to our basic predicate. And um, here's the, the same site, but without the full text. And we can evaluate everything to, uh, to true, except for the in-text spring. So basically, we can get rid of all of this, but we have to keep the in-text. We can rid of the or, because this is false. So this reduces to only the in-text node, and we have to keep the not. So what we can get out of this after running our predicate is a new predicate that is reduced to only not in-text spring. So we just have a smaller program now. And if you look at uh, the same predicate but a different website and evaluate this, you can, for example, see in this case for website Spring.io, there's the terms Java and Spring and was indexed at some other date. And we can also already evaluate the term case up here to false. And if you have an end node and the left hand side is false or any side is false, you can just short circuit everything and it's false. So we wouldn't even have to go down into those trees here because we already know that the result will be false anyways and we don't have to fetch our full text of the website. Okay, so we freed our Boolean algebras with this. Um, I think this is a very good example of an underused free structure that you can use to build very nice DSLs for some problems. Um, you can do partial evaluation on, on it. You can do whole program optimizations, which are very funny. Um, you can serialize the AST because there are no functions inside of it, so you can serialize it to JSON with Cersei, basically boilerplate free, and just deserialize it on, de -serialize it on the other end. Um, what's even uh, better is that FreeBool actually has a traverse instance, and our partial evaluator is just a traverse with an either. And you can even do even more stuff with that, um, but actually that's probably the content of a different talk. So here are some resources. Um, this is the blog post by Chris Stuckel that inspired the free Boolean part. You can find the source code on my GitHub. And otherwise, I hope that now you have feel inspired to go forth and free all the things. That's all I have. Thank you.